we've all heard the phrase, never judge a book by its cover. Well, ironically, when it comes to those modern satirical indie B-movie homages, I'm usually pretty weary that they might just become the very thing they intend to poke fun at. And admittedly, when it came to Tucker and Deal vs. Evil, I find its marketing so indulgent on its schlocky, offbeat camp and relatively tacky looking presentation that I was actually put off watching it for several years because I'm a hypocrite. And oh god, what a bad decision that was. Tucker and Deal vs. Evil is a story about misunderstanding and miscommunication. It very much plays on accentuating cliches and stereotypes, only to literally reverse the role between victim and killer. So let's talk about it. There are many films that boast about being formula game changers due to their mild self-aware subversions to the genre, and yes, while The Cabin in the Woods and Behind the Mask are these excellent satires that capitalize on everything we're familiar with to the point that they're kinda obvious and probably not half as clever as they think they are, Tucker and Deal vs. Evil manages to be playful and creative with the slasher genre setup without needing to whip its dick out to declare itself king of the castle. Instead, I think it's fair to say the film tonally expresses the attitude of its central protagonists. Howdy, officer. Hi. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Behaving with goofy modesty and friendly innocence to represent the positive side of the universe we rarely get to see, along with the ignorant idiotic side that painfully still feels very relevant today. The story follows best friends Tucker and Deal as they purchase a dilapidated cabin in the woods in order to turn it into a vacation home so that they can get some much needed respite from a hostile world. Along the way, however, they encounter a group of dumb college students and end up rescuing one of them from drowning, only for the rest of the dim-witted group to misinterpret Tucker and Deal as crazed serial killer kidnappers responsible for the legend of the Memorial Day Massacre. What I love about the film is that it doesn't try to act any cleverer than it actually is. It essentially presents Tucker and Deal as nothing more than two introverted hillbillies just going about their peaceful business, before a group of arrogant, egocentric college students decide to perceive them as nothing more than unpleasant and dangerous, just because of their appearance and socially awkward personalities. The group just perpetuate a remarkable lack of self-awareness, as they obsess over their own self-worth and wield superiority complexes to make themselves feel better when they find themselves most vulnerable, such as camping in the woods when most of them are clearly ill-equipped. I mean, who the fuck wears heels in the forest? That's rhetorical by the way, I unfortunately know plenty of people that would. Why? I don't know. It's good that you don't know. It's good that I don't know because if we knew, then they would want to kill us too. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I will get to some social subtext later in the video, but here we have an isolated cabin in the woods owned by two strange, ruggedly dressed men with an assortment of sharp, rusty objects that all correlate with our association with the horror genre. Like with pointing out all the references in Cabin in the Woods, it's a bit pointless for me to merely just highlight every instance where the college group misinterpret a situation as sinister, such as seeing a note that says, we've got your friend, when really that's just because the group ran away before Tucker and Deal could talk to them. It totally plays on the conditioning of the genre, where without the necessary context of Tucker and Deal's vacation project, at face value, everything is definitely not what it looks like. Whatever you say, just smile and laugh. That shows confidence. Smile and laugh. You guys, uh, going camping? <laughs> Essentially, the group's self-appointed dictator Chad, who is one of the douchiest douchebags since Russell and Friday the 13th Part 7, fair play if you get that reference, aggressively pressures the group into taking matters into their own hands because they're all alone and no help is apparently coming. So there's a futile hollow sense of heroism that's tragically unwarranted when each college kid hesitantly plays the hero card one by one, only for them to kill themselves accidentally, to which Tucker and Deal assume it's some sort of trendy suicide pact given the absurd improbability that so many fatalities could happen in one day. These kids are coming out here and they're killing themselves all over the woods. Oh my god, that makes so much sense. Oh shit, we have got to hide all of the sharp objects! Except the film never goes out of its way to be so overtly elaborate with each death. It really comes down to simple misjudgment, unawareness, or pure understandable stupidity, like trying to put out fire with what looks like water but is actually fuck 
fucking moonshine. Seriously, these are the kind of dumbass freak accidents I expect to happen if you throw some mind-numbing Jersey Shore-style reality stars into the fucking wilderness. Not that we already have shows like this. Oh, we gotta take the safety off on the side there. Don't do that! Oh! 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 Anyway, the purpose of Chad is to act as the kind of uppity wanker who sees himself as a tragic hero, all because he believes his father was murdered in the Memorial Day Massacre by hillbillies, thus justifying his uncomfortably gratifying urge to seek what he thinks is justice, but he is ultimately the main antagonist of the story, representing that character who thinks the world revolves around him, and that it's his destiny to save the day and get the girl, despite the late reveal that his father was actually one of the killer hillbillies, who raped his mother and thus he has like killer hillbilly genes within him or something like that? The outcome is basically a bad case of comeuppance and karma for acting self-righteously and without reason, with the entire group's demise effectively being a bleak lose-lose situation regardless because they're too intimidated to piss off the menacing Chad because then maybe he might kill them instead. Hell, their behaviour is then juxtaposed with a cop who initially shows suspicion towards Tucker and Deal, only for the cop to willingly hear their side of the story, where from his deduction a certain amount of blame is to be put on both parties for S escalating matters to the point to where they are, inevitably leading to his own fatality at the hands of a loose support beam that Tucker and Deal constantly reminded themselves they were supposed to fix. We've all been there, haven't we? Yet, for all the violence and absurdity generated by contextless accidents and perceptions, at the true emotional heart of the film, Tucker and Deal is more about the evil of judging a book by its cover. I know I said this already, but I want to reinforce the point because while you could see the film from a pure political or economic class spectrum, from a social point of view the conflict is about Deal overcoming his inferiority complex in a world that's conditioned like the horror genre to constantly put him down for being seemingly dumb, uncharismatic and somewhat unkempt. Tucker has learned to embrace his imperfections and enjoy the little things in life that bring solace and happiness to him, and so he uses his vacation as a way to help Deal find his confidence to fully withstand the pressures of judgmental, hostile people, especially a sheltered, taken-for-granted, luxury-dependent subculture oblivious to their own fucking arrogance. Kick the shit out of that little college dickhead for me, would you? Tucker and Deal are the victims of the story. They don't have the luxury these college students have, they're just getting by and keeping out of harm's way as much as possible, only for the kids as the indirect villains to ironically go looking for trouble and ultimately becoming that very trouble. Slapstick horror aside, Tucker and Deal is about being yourself. It's just as much about the virtue of ignorance than the evil of it, in that there's nothing wrong with the way you personally choose to live your life as long as you're not trampling over others. In short, as hard as it is, it's sometimes better to ignore the voices that put you down because they become powerless when you don't respond to them. Alternatively, it's even possible to see it in a more revealing light, in that Chad becomes this literal two-faced monster by the end, embracing the person he has buried deep within him, even if he doesn't entirely accept who or even what he is. The fact he survives puts across this idea that he's somewhat now at home, in the place where he belongs, so you could say... It's a little bittersweet that he's now free to accept imperfection, while Deal finally does the same and uses it to make him stronger, thus becoming the person he fought very hard to be. Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you have not seen Tucker and Deal vs. Evil, uh, think of it as uh, Ash vs. The Evil Dead, and please do go check it out. Uh, it is totally worth your time. Um, if you enjoy what I do here, you want to support this show at all, help me to grow it into something more, um, for just a few dollars a month uh, over on Patreon, you can get early access, you can vote on what the next video could be, just like this video here, and you can even get your name in the credits, get some access to bonus videos, and get into our exclusive Discord chat where you can tell me what you've been watching, what you've been playing, what you've been reading, and even share your own work with me. Ooh, that's exciting. And until next time, stay safe, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and yeah, see you all very soon. Bye.